In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the Patristic Orthodoxy broadcast. This is priest Chad Arneson, rector of Holy Transfiguration Orthodox Parish in Mammoth Spring, Arkansas. This recording is provided free of charge for the purpose of the spiritual enrichment of the Orthodox faithful and as an aid in their pursuit of a God-pleasing life. If you would like to donate to the effort of producing edifying content like this, you can mail a check to Holy Transfiguration Orthodox Parish, 1175 Main Street, Mammoth Spring, Arkansas, 72554, or you can contact us at patristicorthodoxy at gmail.com. May the Lord reward you with eternal riches in return for your temporal generosity. This is episode two of the series entitled, Ye Are Not Your Own. The topic of this series is Preserving and Propagating True Orthodoxy. I would like to entitle this particular episode, The Lord is King. In the service of Orthodox Matins, the Church proclaims with the psalmist, God is the Lord and hath revealed himself to us. This divine statement stands as a bulwark against the slings and arrows of the Antichrist spirit in the world. This spirit of Antichrist is at war with the truth of who God is, as he has revealed himself. This malevolent spirit is at war against the divine rule over all things and all men. Modern man has exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Rather than looking to the source of all things, modern man foolishly looks, as it were, at his own navel and seeks to find in his own mortal coil the telos, or the end, or purpose, of his own existence. Man has institutionalized in the state, in academia, in media, in modern anti-culture, the ancient lie of the philosopher Protagoras, that man is the measure of all things. There is a man coming who is correctly named in Holy Scripture as the man of sin. And when he comes, he will try to convince man to set aside the truth, first by temptation and then by the force of coercion. This man of sin has had various forerunners in human history, and we can expect that if we are not living at the very end of history, there will likely be other such forerunners. These men, enslaved by the spirit of Antichrist, tempt men to set the truth aside, to exchange the truth of God for a lie. Concerning men that have, quote, set the truth aside, end quote, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, in the first book of his famous work, Against Heresies, teaches, They also overthrow the faith of many by drawing them away, under a pretense of knowledge from him who rounded and adorned the universe, as if forsooth they had something more excellent and sublime to reveal than that God who created the heaven and the earth and all things that are therein. St. Irenaeus speaks here of what God has revealed to man. What is revealed to man is chiefly the truth about God himself. And how has he revealed this to man is the question. We may read the answer from St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 1 and 2, quote, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, end quote. It is through the revelation of Jesus Christ who was anticipated by the fathers of the Old Testament and who fulfilled the prophets of Israel that man learns the doctrine of God. It is to the Theanthropos, or the God-man, that man goes to learn of the true God and what he has commanded man to believe and do. Christ God established his holy church, which is also his body, as the pillar and foundation of the truth. This church is founded upon Christ the rock and chief cornerstone, and also upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It is the holy apostles that were sent into the world to preach the gospel, to teach all nations, and to baptize in the name of the Holy Trinity. 
To the church was given the guardianship of the holy mysteries, or sacraments, which incorporate men into the saving body of Christ, and bring man into unity with God by grace. And this reality of union with God by grace is so real that the scriptures even speak of men who are in Christ as partaking of the divine nature. When man comes to Christ God, this necessarily begins with faith. St. Ignatius the God-bearer of Antioch, in his epistle to the Ephesians, teaches, quote, The beginning is faith, and the end is love, end quote. We do not possess the latter without the former. And so we should not be deceived by those who presume to claim the achievement of true love when they at the same time deny some essential article of the Orthodox faith. And neither should we be scandalized by those who claim to have purity of Orthodox faith and yet do not possess love because they remain unpurified of some sinful passion. We do not look to those still struggling for evidence of the truth of Holy Orthodoxy, but rather to the saints who have washed their garments in the blood of Christ and have truly attained to holiness and union with God. These are true fruit true evidence that holy orthodoxy is true, that all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God. Holy orthodoxy does not recognize the existence of saints outside of the church, since there can be no redemption and holiness for sinful man outside of Christ God. And this truth is also self-evident. For while men outside of the church can point to this or that preternatural sign or wonder, yet they cannot establish con continuity with the venerable life of wisdom and true holiness that has always been produced in the saints of the Orthodox Church. And this sanctity begins with faith. As St. Paul wrote, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and also without faith faith, it is impossible to please God. When we look to the symbol of faith, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, we see that the faith of the church begins with God's revelation about himself. Quote, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. End quote. And it goes on, of course. The authority of God as the supreme being and power and authority is confessed by faith. So too is his authority as creator. At the beginning of the creed, we also see a congruence with the first verse of the divine scriptures in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. And hereby the Orthodox Christian, by confessing the creed, implicitly professes agreement and belief in all the scriptures, beginning with Genesis. Let Darwin and Lyell be gone. Let the so-called Big Bang Theory go back to the abyss. Let the mocking of Genesis chapters 1 through 3 by the skeptics and the mockers cease and be silent. For we believe in God, and we receive as authoritative and trustworthy His self-revelation through the fathers, the prophets, and through the Theanthropos, Christ God. We receive the testimony of the holy apostles and of the chorus of the holy fathers in unity in their interpretation of the holy scriptures. We believe in God. We believe in his authority. We believe in him who is the truth. All human self-knowledge begins with the knowledge of what God has revealed concerning himself. All of the created order testifies to the one God to such an extent that men are without excuse, as St. Paul wrote to the Romans. Why is this important to emphasize? Why are we taking time with this? Because the modern world is in open rebellion against our good God. And there exists in the world today the progression of a great apostasy, a falling away from faith in God. Following the resurrection of Christ, there was an increase of faith in the world, 
which grew and filled a large part of the earth with faith and the knowledge of God. Entire nations embraced the cross of Christ and the power of Christ's holy resurrection. The peoples of the Levant, of Arabia, of Egypt, of Carthage, of Spain, of Britain, of Greece and Italy, of the Slavs and Nordic races, and we could continue to name the nations that once accepted holy orthodoxy and were transformed under the sweet yoke of Christ. But what do we see today? We see the result of centuries of falling away from the truth of Christ and of his sweet law of charity among the formerly orthodox nations. Many nations have replaced piety toward God and his holy church with the doctrine of Satan, even if it is often disguised in the precepts of a new pseudo-morality. Perhaps among the chief pseudo-morals implicitly disguised is the command to do what thou wilt, or even to believe what thou wilt. Most are not as brazen as the so-called Church of Satan to come out and command do as thou wilt, but the effect is often the same since the prevailing wind of doctrine preaches such things as what men do behind closed doors in the privacy of their own bedrooms is of no concern, or they may say that the state should treat all religions the same giving to each confession equal rights and privileges under the law. And in this they disregard the rights of God, in favor of the rights of man to have a false freedom. Or we also hear that so long as man is sincere in his beliefs, even if they are mistaken and contradict the gospel or the teachings of the church, such beliefs are to be respected by all, and the party to error should not be proselytized, meaning that no attempt should be made to correct and convince him of and from his errors. A feeling of human unity is prioritized without regard for God himself, and what he has commanded, and what he has revealed, and the Holy Church which he has established. The fundamental error of modern man's apostasy is self-exaltation, and a disregard for the adoration, honor, and obedience due to God. God requires man to believe in him as he has revealed. God commands man to worship him as he has commanded to be worshipped and adored. God commands men to obey him as God. And this obedience for sinful man begins with the command to repent and to believe the gospel. Sinful man's conscience is continually present and available to preach to him that he is a sinner, that he is empty, that he is in bondage to his sinful passions, that he is a slave. May no man have his conscience seared, as with a hot iron, through sins against light and knowledge. May God forbid. There is also in society a rejection of the Christian way of despising worldly riches, Just because communism is evil in its God-fighting dystopian aims does not mean that endless accumulation of money and wealth privately owned is blessed by God. The truly wealthy man in our temporal world is not the man who has great possessions, but rather is the man who is in need of nothing. And since God clothes the flowers of the field, this goal is attainable to man without leveraged or inverse ETFs. There is likewise an ignorance among men both East and West of the obligation of the state to eschew and drive out of society usurers and those who would enslave men through the sinful activity of renting money. Unjust weights and balances have filled the world with avarice because men have forgotten that the same God to whom we owe obedience is also benevolent. He is the lover of mankind." Man refuses to learn of his God, who causes his reign to fall upon the just and the unjust, and has created food-bearing plants and natural abundance, teaching man to give liberally by the examples seen in creation, and also through the precepts of the gospel. Even worldly Protestants, Roman Catholics, and, I am sad to say, even some Orthodox Christians, have pursued the way of material comfort and the accumulation of riches rather than the path of utter trust in the provision of God, who cares for the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. 
To varying degrees, we who want to be true strugglers, I think, can all confess that we have had to struggle with this temptation of Western society. May the Lord deliver all of us from this temptation. But how can we be delivered from this and other temptations of the modern world? This begins with faith in God Himself. We must come to utterly distrust our own selves and rather trust God who loves us. Our focus must be upon God. We must look to Him, live for Him and in Him, and do all things to please Him. Instead of learning of God, man has turned inward to himself. Instead of coming to the light, modern man would rather walk in darkness. And so instead of experiencing the freedom in Christ, modern man is a slave. Modern man has embraced his own enslavement both to the sinful passions and also to the most cruel and bestial of men who have prepared an enslavement system for him. In preparation for this coming enslavement system, we can see a sort of dialectic being formed, not unlike the Hegelian dialectic of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Another way to put this is that the ruling elite put forth, on the one hand, a thesis of a dystopian vision for the future, which they know that some will readily follow, but which a significant remainder of men will be prepared to fight. An example of this thesis is the propositions of the so-called World Economic Forum and their revolutionary thinkers such as Klaus Schwab or the sodomite Yuval Harari. Maybe we can speak in more detail about this part of the dialectic in a future broadcast, but let's continue describing the dialectic. For the second group of reactionary men, an antithesis or antithesis is prepared. But, and this is important to understand, even this antithesis does not represent the true Christian position. Rather, juxtaposed to the revolutionary thesis is another error very subtle in its nuance. For those more traditional ones is prepared a path that we may describe as perennialism. And this concept of perennialism, to borrow from the Cambridge University Press definition, proposes that, quote, that there is a shared core of truth in all major religions, sometimes called a perennial philosophy, and that this core is grounded in and justified by shared religious experiences, end quote. We have seen a movement toward this in the modern ecumenical movement. Such leaders as Pope Francis in a number of statements and actions, or the Soviet patriarch Kirill of Moscow in Baku, Azerbaijan in 2019, have been instrumental in moving their large religious communities incrementally along the path of religious indifferentism. I may speak about these things in detail in a later broadcast, but for now, let's ask the obvious question. What, then, is the synthesis of these two paths? It would seem obvious that the synthesis of these two propositions is the building of something new. It is interesting to note that the hammer and sickle symbol of world communism, along with its stated public meaning, really does seem to have a hidden meaning. In his book, Secret Societies and Psychological Warfare, revisionist historian Michael Hoffman writes, quote, The sickle symbolizes Saturn, also known as Cronus Saturn, or as the Greeks called it, Demiurgos, the operating engineer of the universe as opposed to the creator of that universe. In the reign of Saturn, we see exorbitant building and modeling activities, and this is reflected in the Masonic reference to their god as the big builder or architect, end quote. As to the hammer, it would seem that this part of the symbol indicates the building of what St. Augustine called the city of man, or what we may also refer to as the kingdom of Antichrist. St. Augustine wrote, quote, We see then that the two cities were created by two kinds of love, the earthly city was created by self-love, reaching the point of contempt of God. The heavenly city, by the love of God, carried as far contempt of self. 
In fact, the earthly city glorifies in itself the heavenly city glorifies the Lord. In fact, the earthly city glories in itself. The heavenly city glories in the Lord. The former looks for glory from men. The latter finds its highest glory in God, the witness of a good conscience. It is also interesting to note the similarity of the European Union's facility in Strasbourg with the medieval painter Bruegel's Tower of Babel painting. And when we look at Europe's rejection of God and his laws and reaching towards a future technocratic world order, the Nimrodian architecture appears consistent with the current European trajectory. This coming enslavement system may come before or after another world war that is looming on the horizon as I record this broadcast. But the point is that the spirit of iniquity is at an advanced stage in the world today, and we as Orthodox Christians are not ignorant of the direction it will lead. But whatever happens from a political point of view should not cause us to turn our gaze away from the real and interior battle. The battle which an Orthodox Christian is primarily concerned with is not a battle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ours is the interior struggle of the spirit and soul in which we must cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It is this purpose for which we concentrate first upon the priority and preeminence of God. We wish to submit to His divine authority and sweet rule over us. It is the knowledge of God that the demons first war against, and it is from them we turn away, and rather seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. The Lord is King, He is clothed with majesty. To God our King, adored in Trinity, be glory unto the ages of ages. Amen.